Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last night, SpaceX added another 60 satellites to their Starlink constellation. Using a booster which had flown on five previous missions, it started flying back in December 2019, carrying Dragon CRS-19 to the space station. And yeah, it carried a NROL-108 SOCOM 1B. The booster serial number was 1059. All in all, this was a standard mission, and it was a successful mission. It did put uh, all 60 Starlink satellites into orbit, and now, thanks to better communications, we get some really good footage of this happening. Previously, we would lose signal when these bars came off the side, but now we get to see the whole uh, deployment. But the bad news is that SpaceX did not recover the booster, and that in itself is now becoming a news story, and everybody's asking me to talk about it. So yeah, what we saw was, in the background of the landing ship, some orange glow in the sky, and that was it. The seagulls barely even bothered. And you know, that's a bit of a shame because, well, you know, seagulls are the flying rats of the sea, and I would have loved to seen a rocket land in the middle of them and show it who's boss. So I shall cope with this disappointment by instead analysing this in every way I know, because that's sort of my coping mechanism. As luck would have it, there was another Starlink launch uh, a couple of weeks ago on February 3rd, and it had practically the same flight profile. So looking at the performance all the way up through the initial boost and to the ignition of the second stage, everything looked practically the same, right? There were small deviations in the numbers, but it looks like the booster performed perfectly. And of course, everything got into orbit. So that's not unsurprising. So six minutes, 20 seconds into the flight, the, we're getting ready for the entry burn. That is where the booster lights up three of its engines to slow itself down and make sure it doesn't hit the atmosphere too hard. This is done on all the the booster recoveries. You're looking on the left here, the one on the right is just the vehicle in orbit. Now after it slows down uh, enough, it shuts down those engines and that glow is supposed to go away except that it doesn't go away. We end up with this bright flash which looks decidedly unnominal. It's normal to see flashes of light at this point as it hits the atmosphere going several times the speed of sound, but the sustained burn is wrong. And then we lose uh, the telemetry. If you look in the bottom left corner, that is the stage one telemetry and that is now frozen. Bottom right, we have the stage two telemetry that keeps going. And we don't get any further updates on the vehicle. We don't get any call outs for the vehicle going transonic or the landing burn starting. All we get is that orange glow on the left side, and that's it. So yeah, let's compare it with the launch from a couple of weeks ago. So on the left is last night's flight, on the right is the fl older flight. I've synchronized these in terms of altitude, not in terms of the clock. The clock is slightly different because it took a few more seconds in one case, but you'll see that they pretty much light their engines at the same time. Initially, they just light the center engine, and then a second or so later, they light two more engines, and they use three engines for the burn. So we are going to use those telemetry numbers in the bottom left of the screen to analyze this. We are going to use them to make graphs, because while all that fire and flames looks pretty hot and sexy, they don't tell you the story. So here you are, a graph of acceleration versus time. Those are one second ticks along the bottom. The blue line is last night's booster. The red line is the known good booster. And you can see it ticks along and it rises up quickly. There's a little bump there. That's the lag between lighting the first engine and lighting the other two engines. They both reach uh, your peak of about 40 meters per second. But then the blue line drops off down to just above 30 meters per second, uh, per second acceleration. So that's about a 25% loss of thrust. And 25% is the number I would have expected because if you have three engines and one of them fails, you expect a 33% change. Maybe the center engine is under throttled for this burn. I, I don't know. I don't think so. But it looks to me as if we definitely had a major engine failure, but it continued to operate and provide thrust at a significantly lower level for about five or six seconds before they all shut down. And that means that by the time the entry burn ends, there's a difference of about 150 kilometers per hour, which isn't a huge amount, I'm going to say, given that they're moving at about 5,800 kilometers per hour. But last night's flight is headed into the atmosphere steeper and faster, and you can see it getting ahead here. 
And actually, if you look at the, f the far right of that graph, you'll notice that the blue line goes up faster because it's going deeper into the atmosphere and experiencing more drag. So that is you know, getting slowed down by the atmosphere more compared to the, uh, the old one, which is having a much more chill time. And so the next event is that we lose the telemetry, it becomes frozen. I'm just going to fast forward through this section because we want to get to where we see the cameras on the ships and we see the landing burn. So um, the vehicle comes down, it's decelerating under drag, it goes subsonic, and then at this point it's aiming towards the ship. Now on the left, as soon as we switch over, we see this pulsing orangish glow, whereas we see nothing on the right until a few seconds later, and that's the actual light. Now notice the difference in the color here. The one on the right has known good engine, so it has a bright, efficient flame. The one on the left um, obviously had some sort of malfunction. But also what to realize uh, is that these two things finished their entry burn at the same time, and yet we saw fire on the left, way before we saw the entry burn, or sorry, the landing burn start on the right. And if we look at this screenshot from the moment that we lost the telemetry, you'll notice that the one on the right, the good one, has actually, is actually going faster now because it was higher up and had less drag. So it is actually catching up. Therefore, while the one with the damaged engine should have, uh, did initially get ahead, the other one should have been catching up and they shouldn't have been so far apart with the fire, right? The ignition. The other thing is that there are low clouds over the Atlantic during both of these landings. You can actually see the clouds get illuminated and then when the vehicle comes below the clouds, they get illuminated from below and it's very obvious. So I'm thinking that the one on the left may not actually have been an ignition. It may have simply been burning on its way down. I can't know this for sure. I don't have any special insider information, but it sort of makes sense. If we assume that during the entry burn, one of the engines goes out quite likely the center engine. It renders the vehicle uh, in a state where it will ultimately break during the re-entry because of damage to the uh, heat shield on the bottom. The underperforming engine on its own probably isn't enough to cause the heat shield to fail. After all, it's 150 kilometers per hour out of uh, you know 6,000. Since we only saw a 25% throttle drop, that seems to say that we still had some performance from the engine, which would say to me that the turbo pumps, the fuel pump and the uh, oxidizer pump are still working, but something downstream from that is broken and it's not really generating that much thrust. It's throwing a bunch of propellant out the back. And that's what we're seeing burning here. Whatever's happened, I think, is responsible for the telemetry being lost. Uh, I don't think that SpaceX turned off the telemetry because if you look at the speed right as it goes out, it's the change slows down. So it's like they're losing data and then the data stops. And so at that point, I don't think that SpaceX Mission Control have access to the vehicle, which is why we're not hearing any of the callouts. Likely at this point, they suspect that uh, there's been some damage and it's not going to be able to land. The booster may well just continue on a ballistic trajectory rather than using its aerodynamics. And yeah, it just may be burning as it heads down below the clouds, and that's what we see. Another bit of evidence to suggest that it might be burning and spinning is just the fact that you see that thing pulsing as it comes down, which could be uh, evidence for the vehicle rotating and burning. I highly doubt that is all correct. That's just one set of things that fits the parameters. Uh, it might not be the center engine. It could be one of the other engines. And then you've still got fuel burning up inside the bottom of the, end, the rocket that causes something to fail. Uh, it could be an aerodynamic failure. It could actually be trying to light the engine and just burning in an awful, off nominal way and piling into the ocean. It's hardly a big setback for SpaceX. This booster has flown six times successfully. That is five more times than most rockets. SpaceX are probably already compiling a report for NASA, who will of course be interested since they put people on these rockets. And anything, any failure, even if it's a failure after it's done its primary mission, they are going to be interested to make sure it won't affect an actual ascent. 
SpaceX is out here pushing the reusability further than they have in the past. And they're aiming to get 10 launches out of these rockets. And, well, you know, they're working upwards towards that. But uh, even if they can only get half that, they're still going to be way better than other rocket companies. We also got an Elon tweet confirming that the active fairing half was recovered. And I think what they mean by active is that's the one with the pneumatic latch release mechanism. So if you look on the fairing that the uh, camera is mounted on, there's a line of uh, you know, pressure lines around the outside, and that's what's used to release all the latches that hold the two fairings half. And if you look at the other half as I reset the video, you'll see it doesn't have this line uh, along the fairing interface. So I think that's what they're talking about there. And you know, I had to mention this because it gave me another reason to play this awesome piece of footage once more. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.